right, this is Garrett Martin, the uh, games editor for Paste Magazine. I'm here at the uh, Sennheiser Paste Interactive Studio and Lounge. My guest today is Adam Saltzman of Semi-Secret Software, the uh, designer of uh, Hundreds and Cannibal and Flixel, among many others. How's it going, Adam? Uh, it's good, man. It's yeah. real good. So uh, you're a local. You live in Austin. Yes. So uh, how do you feel about South by Southwest? <laughs> I don't like... Um... So we moved here like nine years ago, so I can't, I'm, I don't think I'm technically allowed to say, get out of my city, because like I came and colonized it too, but yeah. um, you know, it's a, uh, I love that everybody gets to come see it, but it's also, it's it's such a not Austin vibe. Like this is the least Austin-y <laughs> that Austin can be. It's usually so quiet and so laid back and yeah. so relaxed and uh you know, like I almost died three times just driving here, and then it was like twenty dollars to park the car. Oh gosh! And it's just like it gets, it's like very LA instead of, you know, why we moved here. Right. So Where's that people? part is not the best, but I love that all of you know. We don't get a ton of excuses to invite, um, uh, especially video game people to town. This is like one of our two excuses. So. At least I get to see friends. That part is really good. Yeah, so the gaming expo part of it, it's relatively new compared, obviously, to the music side and the film side. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had an event at the gaming expo? Have you ever had a booth there or anything like that? Um, I've helped do the um, uh, uh, Wigos Rancheros Texatron Fantastic Arcade booth. I helped a little bit with that last year, not very much. I haven't right. been able to help with it at all this year, but no. um, that seems to go over well. It's, it's very much not... Uh, 100% in keeping. At least last year, there was a lot of like really big neon, like uh, space marines and uh, dragons, and then there's like our little like indie arcade machines kind of tucked away in a corner. Right. But they were packed the whole time. So, um, you know, something about having like free games that are easy to understand that have this familiar interface, I think. Uh, works really well there. It's really nice it's open to the public as well. You can get kids in there who can actually play games yeah. on like industry events where it's all just a bunch of like middle-aged cynical guys, yep. probably all hungover. Yep, but, that's, um, that's definitely my preference for these kinds of things. I think IndieCade ends up with a kind of a similar vibe. It's a little bit smaller, more low-key, but you get kids and parents coming in to play games together. You get, um, you get something similar at Game City in the UK, and that's... Um, I have two kids now, so like right. it's it's really uh, there's nothing I love better than seeing like parents come in with kids instead of just kind of the same like nothing against sort of like the core gamer group like I'm definitely part of that group in a lot of ways, but I'm you know my passion right now is making games for people that are outside that group because like everybody's making games for the guys who are inside that group and there's this whole huge audience that are moms and dads and kids and all these other people who I think deserve really good interesting games yeah. uh, and uh, I think this is one of the ways that they get to get exposed to that is like they're like it's like them getting to see the world outside of Lego Star Wars kind of right hundreds definitely sort of reached out to I think a much wider audience than the standard gamers that you were just talking about. We really tried to, and the thing that, the, the, the tension that we're always trying to resolve, and it's, it's a made up tension in some ways, but the tension for me is always how do we, how do we craft this thing so that, um, you know, uh, like my two year old son can beat the first three levels. Right. And like uh, uh, conventional wisdom would dictate that in a, a game that a two-year-old can solve some of the puzzles in will just be like a condescending insult to a hardcore gamer. Right. And yet, you know, we didn't have that problem. Like the, you know, we got uh, some joyfully angry messages from like the number two super hexagon player in the world, Jason Killingsworth, a about paced the, games editor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, about the uh, the last few levels of the game. So uh, I feel like we, you know, it's a it's a pretty thin line you have to walk sometimes. But I feel like we actually kind of pulled it off. Where, uh, you know, folks who don't, it's essentially like, for me, it, it, the reason I think it's a false separation or a false dichotomy between like uh, challenging and accessible is um, you know the the accessibility part I don't think has anything to do with difficulty I think a lot of people think that that's what it's all about and I think it's about uh, how much pre-existing game specific knowledge that you need when you sit down to play it and hundreds requires nothing 
you can have never played a video game before in your whole life, and you can sit down and play the game, and it'll teach you how to play itself. It's kind of autodidactic in a way. Right. Um, and I think that's really important when you're doing this stuff. You know, there can be, um, you know, a, let's say a difficult book like War and Peace. Anybody can still pick it up and start reading it. They might not finish it, which is fine. It's a difficult book. And I kind of feel the same way. Like, anybody should be able to pick up a difficult game. Mm -hmm. But maybe, they, maybe they're not able to finish it, but that's fine. At least they were able to access it and start playing it. And I think that's actually really hard to do for a lot of people for a lot of video games right now. Hundreds does a really great job of totally ramping up the difficulty. You know, the first 30 levels or so, it's challenging, but it's never impossible to get past or anything. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the end and you have someone like Jason Killingsworth who is probably the greatest pure game player I've ever known in my he's entire amazing. life. Yeah. And he's not capable of completing those last few levels. Yeah, or at least he's uh, it's it takes some serious effort on his part and that's um, you know uh, there's a lot of games where um, you know even if a lot of the game has um, structure or ideas that I don't like that much, one of the things that I think games can do really well is they'll have this thing where it's almost like um, each of the levels is a lesson and then the crux of the game is kind of your final exam or a test right you know did you did you get it did you understand it and a lot of Mario games are kind of designed that way mm -hmm. um, in, in different subtle interesting ways and we really tried to frame hundreds that way where it'd be like here's a new concept um, but we're introducing it in a very chilled out like there's just one new thing just play with this one new thing, get a feel for it, and then you know, then we'll ramp it up. But then the last time you see that new thing, I do want it to be really hard. I want it to be a challenge for people because you get, that's, I think, uh, that's one of the main ways that you drive satisfaction from playing a game is a, a sense of mastery and, and new understanding and uh, uh, learning and all right. of that stuff. Like the feeling of accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and in and, and genuine, not just a, oh, I shot my birds randomly at the right way, now I get to right. go on to the next thing. <laughs> uh, Where you can figure out how to solve a puzzle and know how to solve that puzzle from yeah. then on. And not I want it to be something you know, random. There's this, there's this uh, old, um, I don't know how old it is, but there's this idea about puzzle design, that really good puzzle design is uh, you put a, a puzzle in front of somebody, and if they don't understand like the core principles of the puzzle or what they're doing exactly, they're simply not gonna be able to solve it. They can't just shake it and have it work, but if right. they know what they're doing, they can do it in like three moves. Yeah. They can just go swip, swip, boop, and you know, like a, a combination lock almost. So, uh, and that, I think, is a really good goal to shoot for yeah. uh, when you're doing puzzle design. So how come when I go to Cracker Barrel and I have that little triangle with the pegs, I can never remember <laughs> how to get it down to just one peg? I've been doing that thing for 30 years. you think I would know that by now. Right, uh, right. Um, so with hundreds, one of uh, the more obviously uh, obvious elements about it is the, the, the music, the soundtrack, the score by Lossel. Yeah. Um, how did uh, you get him involved in the game? Uh, Which Lossel, he's a Cranky Records, uh, used to be on Cranky, I'm not sure if he still is. Yeah, uh, Sort of an ambient experimental artist. Yeah, he's, um, he's completely brilliant. So he had done, he had done some tracks for um, Osmos. Um, which is another kind of chilled out, ambient, slightly puzzly game about circles that you can get on an iPad. Right. Uh, and uh, I had this idea in mind, we had this idea from the very get-go that Hundreds should be an accessible puzzle game, but we don't want to, like we started um, f near the end of the project, we almost panicked and did a 180 and made it all about blowfish that you inflate, and they'd have <laughs> cute little googly eyes and all that stuff. But we, right. wanted, uh, we wanted it to have... Um, one of the reasons that we thought it was cool, like that us as the creators thought it was worth making, was, uh, you know, let's let's make a game that doesn't necessarily feel like a video game. Maybe it feels more like some kind of like weird, futuristic, like medical interface. Like this is a way that you manipulate proteins in the year three thousand or something. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't that be cool? And what would that? Um, how do we want that to feel and what would that look like and part of that is that really crispy sterile kind of aesthetic and part of that is um, is Lossel's kind of like clear ambient kind of like chilled out but slightly mysterious like that that whole thing and uh, I know I wanted something in that vein we didn't really know who should do it and Greg was a big Lossel fan already and uh, 
uh, Brandon Boyer was like, oh, you guys should just ask him and see if he'll do it. And I was like, uh, oh, sure, yeah, why not? Great, let's do that. And he said yes, he was totally on board, and he's been uh, totally amazing to work with. And I've, we found out like three quarters of the way through the project that he's a professional sound designer for games. Okay. He worked for uh, Radical, who did um, this PlayStation 2 Incredible Hulk game right. that was like, that blew everybody's minds uh, when it came out. It was incredible. Was it the Ultimate something, Destruction? Ultimate Destruction, like yeah. So that was, that was Radical's big thing. Yeah, and then they went on to do Prototype. Yeah. yeah. So he's been the sound designer there for like a decade. I had no idea about that, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, we didn't either. I didn't find out until basically um, Radical folded. Uh, like six months ago or right. something. Like right after uh, Prototype 2 came out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, yeah, un unbeknownst to us, like the whole, of course, working with him was brilliant and amazing. He's a super experienced veteran sound designer for games who's really good at his job. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was, it's been flawless. He's been doing a bunch. Our, we have an update we've been working on, and um, every time we, up, like, every time I add one thing to the game, it's like it needs five new sounds now, yeah. and he's totally on board with it, and is finding, even finding spots where we didn't think that we, we needed a sound, and he's just mixing stuff and sending it over and saying, like, no, this needs to go here, and then we put it in, and we go, oh, God, how did we ever, why did, the, why did this ever not make this amazing sound? Right. So, Hundreds, when he first started up, it has that note as saying that it should be experience of headphones on? Yeah. Why did you guys put that, uh, that little warning on there, or whatever? Um, I like to do, par partly that's just me. I am obsessed with sound in games. I think that um, sound is probably like 50 to 60% of what I get out of a game is the audio. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm really interested in sound effects and sound processing and music and the effects that those have on people. You know, when we did, um, when we did Cannonball, it was, um, I got in a fight with the musician uh, Danny Baranowski initially because uh, it was pixel art game and I wanted kind of hi-fi movie-esque kind of cinematic sound to go with it and he was like no, no 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 you can't do that that's not okay to do I was like no 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 we have to do it like because it's just pixels like we need the sound to come in and fill in right. all the stuff that I just didn't have time to draw because like it's Sunday and I need to release the game tomorrow <laughs> uh, and uh, it went a really, really long way to doing it. We were able to take a bunch of shortcuts, but you know, like I, I did all my own foley for the game, and I like really, really obsessed over the stereo panning of certain sounds and how they come in, and tried to get the Doppler right on the jets flying by. Like for a pix like a little pixel art jumpy game, you would think that that stuff isn't that important, but I'm like, I'm to this day completely convinced that that's one of the main reasons that people play that game or have an emotional connection. When you put that, that much game. work into it, you definitely want people to have the headphones on to fully experience yeah, how things yeah, are, yeah, yeah. And so working with Lossal and trying, you know, obsessing over like, oh, well, how should this sound, you know, when, when you're using your warm fingers to melt these icy circles, like we want that to have a really specific sound. And if, if we do 10 iterations on a sound, that's, you know, it's a few hours of work on uh, uh, Lossal's part to, just do one little bitty sound effect and yeah like I want people to appreciate that like there's there's work and detail and love in there that should you know that should matter to people yeah. so are there any particular kind of headphones you recommend because I think Sennheiser probably has a suggestion <laughs> or two for you but, yeah, getting back to hundreds uh, so Pace is out of Atlanta. There's a very well-known uh, video game academic at Georgia Tech named Ian Bogost mm -hmm. who wrote a pretty good article or interesting uh, yeah. article about hundreds for the Atlantic. <laughs> he where he said it's sort of like the you know the hoot couture of video games. It's yeah. a game where it's more of where design is more important than specific game design or anything. How did right. you feel about that? And what do you think about his argument? Um, you know. The main thing I think about it is I think he had a lot of fun writing that article. Yeah. Like, it comes through. Like, you can tell that he's been wanting to kind of write this article for a while, and he hasn't found something to write it about for a while. On the one hand, I feel uh, actually really um, kind of, like, overwhelmed or, or grateful that he thought that, um, you know, Greg Woolman's graphic design is at that level. Right. You know, the idea that he's... Um, and I agree with, like, there's a reason we were so excited to collaborate with Greg on it, is, you know, the idea that his design is functioning on an accessible and attractive international level, that's fantastic. Um, the argument that he makes, though, that Hundreds is 
about being cool and about being exclusive and ex like it's deliberately excluding people in some way. Um, that I that I, I dislike because we we put all this effort into making an inclusive game, making a game where you didn't have to understand video games in order to play it and enjoy it, and you didn't have to like cute animals to play it and enjoy it. Like uh, you don't have to. Um, it doesn't even have to be single player or multiplayer. Whoever's standing around can just reach over and play the game with you. Right. Like it's it's. Uh, you know, we wanted to have a game that had both of these things, that had a cool design aesthetic and didn't unnecessarily exclude people. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that it's currently only, essentially only on iPads, like I see that as being sort of exclusive, but sort of a limit. We're only three people. It's also pretty you know? common. I mean, most a lot of games are only on iOS and not for Android. Right, and we're 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 almost done with the Android port. So like, it's going to be even more broadly technologically accessible. But ultimately, you know, we designed a touchscreen game. It's only going to be on touchscreen devices. So if the right. argument that it's exclusive is based on that, we just have to accept that <laughs> and, right. and roll with that. But uh, you know, I I disagree that there's uh, that there's something inherent in the attractiveness of the design that is somehow repellent or exclusive in some way. Right. Uh, and, you know, maybe we're getting the best of both worlds. Maybe it looks exclusive and cool, but really it's like super friendly and moms love it. Yeah. And if that's the case, then I'm, I guess I'm happy with that too. And that just shows how successful the game has been that The Atlantic would write a possible semi takedown of it, you know? Um, yeah. Kind of, yeah. And I think. Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm it's very positive feelings about it, but I was I was surprised at the conclusion, based on the aesthetic, that it was exclusionary in some way. When yeah. I feel like the design, we just like, uh, you know, we obsessed over the design and the inclusiveness of the design for a, like a year. Like I had all the all the original most of the level design, like ninety percent of the level design was done last March. Cool. You know, in the next like eight or ten months, we're all just spent like obsessively refining it and yeah. getting those, especially those first 20, 30 levels, getting that flow to be just right so that we wouldn't box people out. And you've had a lot of like post release work to have to do on it as well, right? You've had a few patches you've had to push out. Yeah, yeah, there were some really unexpected um, issues, uh, some of which were not our fault and some of which were totally our fault. Uh, but we've got it really nice and stable now, and we're just working on. Um, Pushing out not the, not now things to stabilize it or to fix it, but to actually beef it up. We had at the last minute we put in this cool mode where you can kind of play in an infinite way, like it's sort of like a, a, right. a Tetris mindset, you know, like just keep playing. It's going to throw random challenges at you. How do you, how does it go? How do you handle yeah. it? And um, yeah, once I unlocked that, that was sort of I thought yeah that was like the true hundred. It's like yeah, you, you do all this practice work. That's to get kind up of to your the, final exam, right? For yeah. you know now you've done all the lessons. Here's your test. Yeah. Um, but I didn't actually personally enjoy playing it. I felt like it had a fundamental gameplay flaw. So one of the things we've been doing over the last couple of months is figuring out how to solve that. Yeah. How? What can we do to push? And a lot of games have this problem. You know, what can we do to push the feeling that, um, you know, how can a good player use their skills to? Uh, make faster progress. I, I think you see a lot of iOS games especially where if you are, even if you're a really good player, uh, if it's an infinite arcade style game, like the first five minutes that you sit there, you're just like, yeah, 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 I know how to do this part. Like I'm clicking through, like, like yeah. you can't get past that initial stage. And Cannibal doesn't have that problem for a variety of reasons. Drop 7's hardcore mode doesn't have that problem. And I think it's one of the great iOS designs. Right. Um, and, but our endless mode definitely has that problem right now. So we, we've been working on new sounds, new graphics, a new gameplay mechanic that's exclusive to endless mode that is really designed specifically to let people who like to take risks and who think of themselves as a more skilled player to uh, play through that mode more strategically and more quickly. All right. Well, hey, Adam uh, Saltzman from Semi-Secret Software, thanks for coming out to the Sennheiser Paste Interactive Studio yeah. and Lounge. It's been a really good talk. Thanks for and, having uh, me. Yeah, we have more interviews coming up, so uh, stick to the website here that we run that we call paste.com. Thanks.